Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Business and People podcast. This is episode 55. It is a great pleasure to introduce Mr. Ben Baker to the show. Now, Ben is the president of Your Brand Marketing. He's a published author and focuses on a lot of things, but potentially... Uh, Predominantly, he focuses on employee retainership, making sure that the workplace culture is one that really emphasizes the founder's visions and goals, making sure that everybody's buying into that, but also on a personal branding mission, making sure that who you are and what you do is congruent in the message that you're delivering out to the marketplace. Now, that's massively important because it makes sure that what you're saying is congruent with what you're doing. And we're going to talk with Ben about how he helps people grow their brand, how he helps them with business, and of course, his story. So it gives me a great pleasure to introduce to the show, Mr. Ben Baker. Ben, thanks so much for joining us. What a great introduction. I love it. Thanks for having me on the show, Walt. Hey, thanks, man. It's, it's great to have you here. Now, I've, I've looked through your bio. You, for the first yeah. start, let's, let's focus on your brand marketing because you've built that from nothing over the last 12 years. How did you get into a, a company or how did you decide to start a company focusing on branding and personal branding to grow that to the point that it is today? Well, I've been in the communications game for about 25 years now. Mm -hmm. I started off about 25 years ago. I got out of high tech. About I was in high tech. I was flying about 200 days a year. I was the you know the super elite. If if I had a if I needed to get on a plane and you were in my seat, you were out and I was in. Wow! You know, it was it was just it was a brutal life. It was fun when we first got married, but my wife and I looked at each other and said, "This is probably a divorce waiting to happen." And I <laughs> I, I got out of the high tech industry, and I'm I'm actually glad I did. But what I did is I took a, what do you want to be when you grow up training? I had a buddy of mine who was an industrial psychologist and he ran me through a huge battery of tests. You know, what do you want to be when you grow up? What, what are you good at? What are you really passionate about? What do you love to do? And what I like to do is I love to tell stories. I love to tell other people's stories. I love mm -hmm. to help them understand who they are, what they do, why they do it, why other people should care. Mm. And that's where we drove into marketing. And the first thing I did was I killed a lot of trees. I got into the direct, about 25 years ago, I got into the direct mail business. Uh -huh. And, you know, big presses, huge roll-to-roll -roll presses running at, you know, 35, 50,000 sheets an hour. Wow. You know, just, you know, just killing a lot of trees and just putting out an enormous amount of direct mail. And it was a lot of fun, it really was. And I still keep my hand in it. Every once in a while, I'll do a direct mail job, you know, usually through a buddy of mine who has a company, just to keep my hand in it. Okay, That's But amazing. what I realized was, before you can tell your story, you gotta understand what your story is. And I realized before you can market, before you can advertise, you truly absolutely need to know what your brand is. Mm. You know, what is that, what is it that makes you unique? What is it makes you special? Who are you special to? And really why should they care? So about, well, I guess it's 12 years ago now when I got, you know, when I left the company I was working for and went out on my own, it, it just was, it was time to make that change. And my customers were really wanting me to make that change. And that's really where the impetus of your brand marketing came out. Now, I will tell everybody, starting a company in January 2008, in the middle of the biggest recession that our, our generation has ever seen, probably wasn't the best idea. In hindsight. But, you know, that's hindsight. But my customers took care of me. And you know what? I had trust. I had relationships. I had good customers that took care of me. And 12 years later, we're still around. So it's, it's, okay. it's a great thing. So one of the things that I saw on your site, Ben, was that um, uh, you, you had a comment there, which was um, storytelling is not a passing phase. Mm -hmm. And in terms of, so you're looking at the, the, um, the concept that people need to understand what their story is before they can tell it in a way that engages their customers. Do you find that as you start working with a company, that that takes a bit of digging or do you find that the founder knows what their story is um, but nobody else does like how when, when you start working with someone what's the what's the norm in terms of starting working with a with a company well the bigger the company is the more convoluted things are right okay there are, there are very few very large corporations that truly can go into any office at any time and say right what's our brand story 
and have people get it right. Mm. And it's just a matter of that's onboarding, that's culture, that's communication, that's leadership. And it's just the fact that a lot of companies don't tell a brand story. They, they have these lofty mission and vision statements mm. where, you know, 12 people get around in a room where they go away for a weekend and they, they come up with these six pithy words and a two sentences of a mission statement. And they sit there and go, yeah, that's who we are. That's great. But they don't live it. Well, okay. They don't live the statement. These are these are things that they you know they'll say these things. They'll create them, and then they'll go up on a wall somewhere, or they'll get put in a binder somewhere. But they don't get lived throughout the organization. Every single decision isn't through it. You know, it, they're not using this in terms of their onboarding. Or if they are, that's the last time an employee hears those words. Wow. It has to be done day after day, week after week, year after year. Have to be retelling that story. And you have to allow your employees to be able to tell their story in their own words, because when they do, it resonates with them. They'll, re they'll remember it, they'll recall it, and they'll live it, instead of it just being words on a page somewhere. Is it too late, Ben? So I can hear, I can hear a company owner right now who's got 30 employees, he's been doing business for 15 years, and he says, it's too late, Ben. Like, we've been, we've been in the marketplace for so long, we just do what we do and you know, accept what we accept. Is it too late at any point to redefine the vision and to redefine the story of the company? I've rebranded re story, you know, companies that have been 85 years old. Wow, there you go. Okay. You know, I've, I've had companies where the grandchildren are now the owners where grandpa took, you know, started the company you know, 85 years earlier. Mm. They don't do the same things they did 85 years ago. They don't do business the same way. Their customers are not the same. The, you know, the, the products that they put into the table are different. You know, and with that, the brand story needs to evolve. So there is no time out there where it's too late. Wow. It really comes down to sit there going, where are you today and where do you want to go? You know, your brand story is not just where you are today. Mm. It's where did you come from? What got you to where you are today? What was the you know what was the good, the bad, and the ugly that happened along the way? Who do you serve? What do you do? Why do you do it? Who do you do it for? And more importantly, where are you going? Yeah. Because if people within your company understand where you're going, if they understand what they do matters and what they do is important to the benefit of the company and you help the company grow towards their official goal or their, their goals, you're going to become more engaged. Mm. You're going to be engaged. You're going to want to stay with the company and you're going to want to grow with the company. I want to, and those to things are important. I'll come back to that in a second because the other thing that I saw on your site and, um, and it's fascinated me. So I want to come back to it is the 70% of, of uh, employees are disengaged and we've talked about that with previous guests so I want to come back to that in just a second so um, let me let me do that but before I do can I ask you then is it too early so we covered is it too late no never we can redefine that story at any point in time to make sure that we're all aligned and we're all driving down the same path is it too early I'm a founder I'm just getting started um, I've got a concept you know maybe I haven't even registered my, my business yet I'm about to go out on my own um, what the heck do I need a brand story for you need a brand story because that's what's going to, when you have employee number one, two, five, 10, 20, it's going to be important. Yeah. When it's just you, your brand story is what differentiates you. If When you're starting a company ground one, day one, your brand story is, this is who I am. This is what I do. This mm -hmm. is why I do it. And this is where I'm going. And this is how I help you, Mr. and Mrs. Customer. Yeah. That's your brand story when you're starting out. Mm -hmm. That brand story will change. But when you hire employee one, the only way you're going to get them to be able to be in lockstep with what you're doing and believe what you believe and be able to speak in your language is if they have, if you and they have a common story. So what? it's a matter of, it's a matter of using it to onboard and to have something that resonates. So when they're out there talking to their customers, they're speaking the same language that you are. And to really, to buy into the message of the company, do you know, as, a, as a company founder myself and, and, and yourself as well. So let's, let's talk at that level. Do you find it difficult 
personally and so you can address it personally or you know from clients that you've worked with do you find it difficult to to engage employees in the brand story because and and let me preface that by saying um from from personal experience when i used to work for a company i would tend to say that 90 percent of the employees in that in my personal experience were there for a paycheck they were there right. because they got a job you know they were looking that's a skill set that I have. They got a job, they signed up, they get started. And you might, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but obviously there's a, there's a reason that your company is so successful is because a lot of companies find themselves in that same space. So do you find it difficult then to, to bring in and onboard employees in a way that really buys into that brand story as opposed to, hey, we've got an admin role, can you just sit there and answer the phones? Here's the challenge. Most entrepreneurs, most founders of companies are in a business because they absolutely are passionate about something. Yeah. The thing that they're probably not passionate about is leading a team, you know, training a team, onboarding teams, yeah. you know, motivating teams, being, being that leader. They, they got in because that's they not what saw they got a into problem. Business for. No, that's not what they got into no, exactly. business for. Most people who are entrepreneurs and, and that's why a lot of small business people remain small business people, mm. you know, because it, it's, it's an Achilles heel yep. because you don't know how to manage people and managing people is tough. There's, you know, there's a million training routes that people can go down to, to look at that, that training people. But is there a, is there a quick fix from your perspective? Is there a, um, you know what, even if you've never been in a leadership position before or you're struggling, here's a good way, here's a good yeah. framework to work with. Have you found that? Here's a good thing. Trust your people, take care of your people, empower your people, and they will take care of your customers. Beautiful. So really that simple. If that's all you focus on, that John and Mary and Fred and Joe are your people and you look after yeah. them in alignment with your own brand story and your own vision for the future, they will then do the right thing by the company and by the customers. Is that about right? Exactly. It's too many people that own companies tend to micromanage because they're not going to do it exactly the way I want to. <laughs> and they're not. Never. Here's the Never thing. In a million years. No, I remember Gary Vaynerchuk saying this is that, no employee is ever going to treat your company the same way you do because they don't own it. Yeah. They don't own, if you want employees to think of your company exactly the same way that you do, you need to give them an ownership stake. Yeah. And you know, it's really that simple. Equal to yours. If you want the passion to be equal to yours. Exactly. So all you can do is motivate, train and empower your people. Mm. Say, this is what we do. This is why we do it. This is who we do it for. These are the things that we stand for. This is what's important to us. This is how we truly help our clients. You know, I trust you to do the right thing and just let them do their, do what they were, what you trained them and what, and what you hired them to do. You I know? heard a, a very, very uh, qualified CEO um, that we had the pleasure to interview a little while ago saying when it comes to delegation, don't tell them how to do it. Just ask them to perform the task. So in other words, exactly. don't, don't say, please do it this way. One, two, three, four, five, unless it's imperative that something is done in that specific way in that specific order. But in terms of ownership and owning the task and owning the, the role that they have, if you back that down a little bit and simply say, Hey, by the end of the week, we need to have this done. All yours. And yeah. let somebody to have the, the trust and the ownership to, to move that forward in their own way. How do you feel about that? And one more step. And why? Okay. This is what we need to be done by the end of the week. And this is why we need it done by the end of the week. Right. And this, this is, is why, why it's important. And why we need it done by that particular time. Exactly. And even if you're giving somebody a step-by-step -step process and you say, listen, we need it done this, 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 and this. And this is why. Yeah, right. So, yeah. so make this is there. why we do it this way. So that statistic, 70% 70, 70 of people are disengaged at work. And, and again, I've, I've heard that. I've seen that. Yep. Uh, I've experienced that. Um, so 70% of people are disengaged. Do you feel that by the way of communication with your team, you can change that? Yes. Yeah. You've seen. Absolutely do. 
You know, to me, it all comes down to leadership. Mm. And, and whether it's frontline leadership, whether it's mid-level leadership, whether it's senior leadership, whatever, it comes down to know, like, and trust your people. You yeah. need to listen to them, you need to understand them, and you need to value them. Mm. If people feel that they're listened to, they're understood, and they're valued, if they feel that they matter, if they feel that the work that they do actually matters and that the work that they do is actually helping the company succeed and they're motivated to do this, they're mentored to do this, they're coached to do this, and they're rewarded for doing this, they're going to be, they're going to be engaged. Yeah. Nobody wants to be out there looking for a job. Nobody, mm -hmm. nobody, nobody wants to be sitting there with a resume in their hand hoping that they're the one that's going to be hired of one of 100 you know, resumes that's out there. Mm. You know? I would much rather stay with the company that I am if I'm being treated well, yeah, sure. if I'm valued. Mm -hmm. But if I'm not being valued, if all I am is another, you know, another number, you're just one more person that could either get hired or fired tomorrow, why would I show a company any loyalty if they're not showing any loyalty to me? Yeah, definitely. And again, I, I keep coming back to, to the research I did before the show, but um, the, other, the other comment there on the site, which is, um, which is prevalent is that losing an employee prematurely or, or at any point in time can cost a company a hundred thousand dollars. So in terms of bottom line impact, you know, this kind of stuff is, it really does. It really does matter. Okay. And can I take you back 12 years? As you said, sure. 20, 20, uh, 2008, you've decided to go out on your own. As you said, you, your customers were, were good to you. What did the first, what was the, what were the first things that you had to do to start your business? Well, for me, it was process. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a big believer in process and procedures and having systems in place to make things easier. Mm -hmm. The first thing I did was I built my brand. The okay. first thing I absolutely did is I sit there and said, okay, and it's beyond having a logo and a color palette. Yeah. Most people think that a logo and a color palette is a brand. Those are avatars and their colors. That's all they are. Mm -hmm. It's understanding who are the people that I help. Okay. What makes me valuable to them? Why should these people care? And I know I keep going back to it, but it, it is mission critical to understand who your clients are and who they're not. Okay. There's seven and a half billion people out there in the world. Most of them will never care about you. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Yeah. You, know, you only need a handful. Me, okay, go ahead. No, no, no. You only need a handful. You only, I mean, you only need a handful. If, yeah. if, if 50 people called me tomorrow and said, Ben, we've, we've got a $50,000 contract that we, we need to handle right away. And I had 50 of those going at the same time. I couldn't handle it. No, exactly. You're done. There's not a single person that would be able to get the service that they need at that no. level. So, exactly. yeah, so, so coming back, so um, defining who your customers are, defining who your customers aren't. And then, so we've got, we've got a story in terms of, who you'll be in the marketplace and and what did you do from there did you assemble a team did you have a team did you go out get a few clients then need to to scale up like what was the what was the step well i was lucky that where i was because i was still in the communication business i was before mm. a lot of my clients followed me i got i got lucky i mean i put a note out that said you know uh, brand new name same great service nice and you know i had clients there that i had for a decade and they all followed me. I would say that of say a hundred clients, probably about 85 or 90 followed me. Wow. That's fantastic. Um, you know, when I left How and I was quite lucky, and I, quite honestly, a lot of them are still with me 12 years later. So I've got clients that are over, you know, that are over 20 years old. Yeah. Wow. And the reason is, is because I take the time to understand who my clients are are and what they care about, yeah. what's important to them, how do they want to be treated, what makes them tick, what are the things that they need to have and when do they need to have them. Like I have government clients. Mm. Government clients all revolve around March 31st in Canada. Okay? All right. okay. That's government year end. They okay. need to spend their budget by that date. And if they don't spend the money, they lose it. Right. So they need to figure out how can I get my money spent? How can I make sure it's taken care of? Not only is, is the job complete, but it's invoiced properly. Yep. And you know, everything is in the right place and everything's done properly. And it's all about making sure that you understand their policies and procedures and what does it take to make them look good. That's a really and, interesting point. I, I, I think if there's, it doesn't matter if there's 
the people who are listening to this, their product is a product or a service or whatever, that in-depth knowledge of how is my product or service impacting my customers? What do they want from me to be able to, to deliver? I mean, to be able to keep a client for 20 years um, means that every single time that invoice comes through and the finance department is looking at the, at the cost, they pay it happily. And the only, the only way that that occurs, in my opinion, and, and you know, just reflecting back what you're saying there, is that you genuinely, and, and, and we're talking to everybody on the show, whatever it is that you're doing is, is of such high value to the end customer that mm-hmm. they, they beg to pay the invoice. Please, Ben, make sure that you know, next month we're still a client. Well, and that's important. It's, it's value, it's not price. Yeah, sure. I will guarantee you, if I'm the cheapest person out there, I've made a mistake on my quote. Yeah. <laughs> and someone should accept I, that quote quickly so they can work with you. At a very gym. quickly work with me because <laughs> you know what? Obviously I've made a mistake somewhere in the quote. I, I pride myself that I am never the cheapest. Yeah. I'm never the most expensive, but I'm certainly never the cheapest. Mm. My goal is always to provide value mm-hmm. for what I do. And it's value in the minds of my customer. Nice. You know, what is it going to take for them to look good to their bosses? What is it going to make them to make sure that what I do positively uh, impacts their customers? Yeah, nice. Because you know, that's what it's all about. If you can make people look good, if you can make it easy to work with you, if you can make sure that they feel that they're taken care of, the price argument goes away. Yeah, definitely. Always. And if it doesn't, you're dealing with the wrong clients. Absolutely. And, and your, or your service or value offering isn't at the point that it should be. Um, Absolutely. So, Ben, you've, you've then created this amazing company that, you know, has been able to keep, keep clients for 20 years and, um, and grow with you. Knowing what you know now, what would you do differently? What would I do differently? Let me ask that a different way. Were there, Go ahead. I'm sure that along that journey, in every entrepreneur's journey, there's been moments when you go, whoops, <laughs> that didn't quite pan out the way it should. Yeah. Um, what, was the, what was the biggest whoops that you've made? What did you learn from that? Like, what are some of the lessons from a business owner's point of view, a business growth point of view that you've come to know now? I think within one client, I got complacent. Okay. I, I will be perfectly honest. I, yeah. I got to a point where I assumed I knew what they wanted and what they needed and what was, you know, what was important to them. Interesting. So how did, you, new, how did that come to play? How, what, like, well, what new people do? came into the organization. Yeah. You know, and new decision makers um, and new, you know, okay. you know, things, things changed within the company and their dynamics changed. And instead of me really listening and being aware of what the change was, I was complacent in where where things have always been. And what happened? You know what? I lost a portion of their business. I didn't lose all their business. Yeah. But I certainly lost a, a, you know, a large opportunity. Um, And one of my competitors ended up getting it because they had the relationship. They asked the right questions. They were, you know, they were putting something forward that I just wasn't aware of. And you know, it happens. It, it happens to the best of us. It happens to the worst of us. Yeah. You know, we always need to be aware that things are changing. There is no given. There is no absolute. Just because the way things were that way doesn't mean that that's the way they are or that's not the way they're going to be. And people move within companies. Relationships change. Needs change. Priorities change. Politics within companies change. And if you're not always keeping an eye on that, you're in trouble. How has that manifested in what you do at your brand marketing? So taking that story, the fact that you, there was a client that you, were, you got complacent, you know, obviously their needs had changed and moved. What do you do now at yourbrandmarketing.com to make sure that that doesn't happen again? My attitude is if I haven't had a face-to-face conversation whether it's a zoom chat or whether it's face you know face to face or whatever every 90 days with my clients i assume i don't know them wow okay you know i assume that if every 90 days i haven't had some type of one-on-one touch to sit there and say 
How are things going? What's coming up? What's new? What are you guys looking at for the next quarter or the next year or the, you know, mm -hmm. or, or, you know, new projects, what customers are coming up? You know, all those types of questions. If I'm not asking that every 90 days or so, I'm assuming mentally I'm out of the loop. And, and I may not be, but sometimes it's just checking in. Is that you personally handling that or is that an account manager or is that part of one of your team or are you yeah. on the phone with someone? Are you driving out to their business? I, I'm doing it myself. I mean, we're small enough an organization that, you know, the work really goes through me. Yeah, okay. I used to, when I was before 2008, when I was with another company, we had 30 staff mm -hmm. and I had sales reps and you know, account managers and all that kind of stuff. Cool. And you, you're right. I mean, you really had to go out with them once a quarter, you know, to the major accounts and be able to make sure that you were having those conversations. Otherwise you're out of touch. Or out of the way out of touch. Now, you know, I don't have a lot of clients. I have a lot of really good clients and I have a lot of very large clients. Yeah. Nice. And, you know, so it's a, my ability to actually have those conversations one-on-one -on -one is possible. Yeah, sure. And is I it, don't want I don't want to have 500 clients. I don't want to have 1000 clients. It's not where I want to be. I don't I don't need to be a 50 million dollar business. Yeah, sure, sure. I had uh, an interview with a very successful lawyer and I said, um, how's business? And he said I have too many clients and too small. And that's that's the same thing like it was, you know, from a services business and especially especially as an entrepreneur, you know, I think we uh, one of the things that we all need to do as collectively is define the kind of business that we want. You know, yeah. for, for some of us, um, it's, we want to list publicly IPOs, you know, take the hundred million dollar buyout and buy the, the hydrogen yacht as Bill Gates has just looked at for 640 million. You know, that, that's kind of, that's a, a specific path. And, but I wouldn't say that's the majority for the most part, yeah. For the most part, the entrepreneurs that I speak to, they want a comfortable and happy life and they want to be able to have some sort of legacy to pass on um, mm -hmm. as they're moving forward. So defining the kind of business that you want. And, and it comes back to what you were saying before, who is my client and who is not my client? Being able to, to start your business or, or grow your business in a way that, that you mentioned before, that is not a divorce waiting to happen. That's not yeah. a... You know, that's not a, um, a hundred, eight, hundred hour a week heart attack, that it is the, the way that, that you want things to be. So um, where did the book fit into that, Ben? How did, how did the book come to be? And how did, you, how did you get published? How did you become an author in this? Yeah. Two, three years ago, I, I do a lot of work at the universities. And what I do is I go up there and I do a lot of volunteering. And one of the universities that, that I work with has a day on a quarterly basis that I never miss. And what you do is you go up there and you do networking skills with the client, with the, with the, with the third year students and also interview skills. Okay. Yeah. So you, you run them through uh, two or three hours of, of networking and then you run them through two or three hours of, of interviewing. Wow. And it's a lot of, it's a lot of fun, you know, That's because cool. they get a lot out of it. I get a lot of, out of it. You get to see the passion, you get to see what, you know, what, What's going on in the next generation? Awesome. I find that most of these kids are extremely smart. Yeah. Most of these kids cannot tell you what their, what their true value is, who they're valuable to, and why. Yeah, okay. And that's, it just comes with you. I'm sure at 18, 19, 20 years old, I couldn't either. No, exactly. You know, it's it's just, hard to know where your feet are on the ground. Exactly. At that point in time, all you're trying to do is make that next paycheck or, you know, get that first job. Yeah. And that's, that's what you're trying to do. You know, your, your third year university, you're, you're trying to finish up your schools. You're trying to get, you know, that first job. It's you time. haven't had this, the life skills yet yeah. to be able to be comfortable enough in your own skin for the most part. Yeah. There are kids that are, but the most of them aren't. And I went looking for a book to help them and I couldn't find anything I liked. So I wrote it. Wow. And this book is stories from my life, lessons that I have learned and at the end of each chapter, I pose a question and I've got two or three pages of blank lines for you to put in your own answers. Wow. How awesome is that? And what I also did is I tapped about 10 or 12 friends of mine on the shoulder who are entrepreneurs. And I said, here's four questions. Answer them. Nice. And I said, I don't care if you give me 500 words or 2,000 words. 
You know, you decide how long or how short you want this to be. And I made each one of those a chapter. So all 12 people answered the same questions. That's a great way. To their go. own way. Yeah. And what it really does is it, it's a 200 pages of just all sorts of experience. Wow. And, and here's some things about life and, you know, who you are and things that you should be thinking about. Things like, what are you passionate about? Mm. And why are you passionate about it? Yeah. You know, what are the three movies that you absolutely love in life and why do you love them? Nice. You know, who are the teachers that you learned from? Never mind the, the subjects. Who are the people that actually really taught you the life lessons that you're going to remember for 20 years? Wow. Like I, I still have teachers in high school and university that I couldn't tell you what we learned in terms of the subject matter, but they taught me incredible life lessons that are wow. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I can think of a few myself. So um, guys, if you're listening to this, um, you can go to yourbrandmarketing.com and just go to the authors section and you can, uh, you can pick up a copy of Ben's book, which is, yep. uh, which is powerful personal brands. And Ben's got a lot of other stuff there. So you can actually, you can get in touch with Ben. So again, it's yourbrandmarketing.com and you can also download for free 10 ways to increase employee engagement straight away. So if you've got people on your team or you ever plan to have people on your team or, Let's go with this. If you are on a team and you want better engagement at your workplace, you can also pick that up as well. 10, 10 ways to increase employee engagement. Grab Ben's book there. It's powerful personal brands. So Ben, from your position now, what's, what's next for you? Where, where will we see you when you grow up? Well, the exciting thing is right? what do you want to be when you grow right. up? I might get older. I'm not planning on growing up. No, it's right? okay. But cool. ask my wife. I'm never going to grow up. She, no. She's got a Peter Pan forever. Uh, we just created a, a series of online courses. The, mm. the best course is how to retain employees through leadership. Mm. And it, what I did is I took my two day intensive workshop and I turned it into 23 videos and a 50 page workbook. And wow. that's also available on my website. Well done. And it's, it's designed for first time leaders, leaders that are that want to become better leaders mm. to be able to understand how to lead properly you know, for me, it's it's work. It's it's one on one or team workshops. I, I absolutely love. I love keynote addresses. I, you know, I love the doing the consulting. My clients are North America and worldwide. And what I love to do is help teams get better. I love helping companies communicate more effectively. I help love helping them engage, retain, and grow employees. Awesome. That's 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 what is and what's next. Fantastic. Fantastic, mate. And I can see that the the passion that you started your brand marketing with is still with you very much today. I mean, you must get a kick out of of working with businesses and you know d helping them move their worlds forward. I absolutely do. I absolutely do. I'd love love to get down to Australia. I'm I'm hoping to come down and do some business in, in August. So nice. we'll see whether we can get some people that are you know maybe some of your listeners are are interested in having me come down. So fantastic. Well, make sure you keep in touch, man, and we'll 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 happily uh, shout you a dinner when you're down here and see if we can oh, that'd be awesome. organize some people to come and chat with you as well. Ben, I am absolutely thrilled to, to, to chat to you. I love the message that you have with creating that story behind the personal brand of a company and then each individual role in terms of leadership and in terms of engagement. And I guess if we took a survey of, of entrepreneurs across the globe and we said, what are you, what are you hoping for in life? Their predominant answer is happiness. You know what I mean? And do it hope. You know, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And being able to, to uh, engage those employees or create that happiness in a work environment means that there's a lot more of that to go around in any, in any world. So I love what you, what you're putting out there, mate. And again, from a branding perspective, it's taken me a, a long time to understand that branding is not just, as you said, a logo and a business card, but branding is the, the back story behind what we do and where we are. Um, so again, I appreciate the opportunity to come and chat to you about that. I think that's such a, a fascinating thing. Um, guys, if, if you are listening, you want to keep in touch with Ben, you can head on over. He's active on LinkedIn. Um, you can um, grab hold of some information there, but do head across to yourbrandmarketing.com and keep in touch with Ben. Ben, thank you so much for, for the generosity of your time. I really appreciate it. I know that your podcast is, is blowing up as well. 
Um, you're 160 episodes, I think now. From- Something like that, about 160 episodes in somewhere. So in guys, range. if you want to tap into and listen to Ben, he does uh, an episode a week talking about branding and, and literally asking people, what's your story and being able to get those stories out there. So mate, again, thank you for your time. I appreciate your story and uh, I wish you all the very, very best moving forward. Walt, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for allowing me to be on your show. Had a lot of fun today. Awesome, man. Hopefully we'll see you when you come down to Oz. Cheers, Ben. Absolutely.